so uh, Tom, shall you kick off? <laughs> sure, absolutely. <clears throat> I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a couple slides that I want to run through, and and really what I wanted to do is just uh, give some some uh, perspective of the types of questions we're getting from our clients, uh, concerns you know related to the the, the PPP loan program and, and forgiveness. So let me just uh, keep rolling here. All right, can everyone see that uh, that slide? Yes. All right, perfect. <clears throat> All right, so uh, today we're gonna to talk about kind of some record keeping ideas and, and, and really preparing for the loan forgiveness. Uh, at this point, you know, many people uh, have received their PPP loan and we've got a lot of questions on what they should be doing, how they should be tracking and what their concerns are with, with the forgiveness uh, side of the loan. Um, oh, that's me. And, uh, so, you know, I, I work for Raymond, just a little bit about Raymond. Um, yeah, you know, I think everyone's probably familiar. Uh, good number of offices across the state. Uh, we do a lot of services across CPA uh, and consulting. Um, so PPP, next steps. <clears throat> so what we've talked about with a lot of our clients is is really from a record keeping standpoint. Uh, you know, there's a couple options that seem to make a lot of sense for most clients, and, and they're either they're either putting it in a separate checking account or savings account. Uh, or they're creating a, a separate <clears throat> general ledger account within their system. And, you know, the, we've got recent guidance on the safe harbor, uh, which, which is going to, uh, on, on the essential need of the loan, which I think a lot of people were concerned about this documentation uh, process early on, but I think it's still going to be important, but that safe harbor is, is going to cover the under $2 million loans. Um, but as far as you know, keeping separate, uh, you know, keeping a transactional history. You know, in a perfect world, clients are trying to kind of show that, hey, I got a $500,000 PPP loan, and then here's here's all the transactions, here's all the the uses of those funds. And so, whether you're going to do that in a separate account or whether you're going to do that within your one account with your general ledger system, setting up a separate PPP loan. Uh, but we're really encouraging clients to kind of each week evaluate what their PPP expenses are, make copies of invoices and payroll registers, and, and just really aggregate all the data um, so that uh, when it gets time to, to calculate forgiveness and supply information, uh, they, they really have got uh, all their ducks in a row. Uh, and the, the other thing is we really said, you know, talk, you know, make sure you're staying in communication with your lender because, you know, e each bank, I'm sure you guys will, will have your own process of, of, of accepting information and processing information. So it's important to, you know, understand that sooner than later so you can align your practices and your data collection to easily, you know, feed into uh, the, the, the forgiveness uh, submission uh, forms or format. Um, you know, and another thing is, this is probably the biggest question I get, just, just to give you some perspective of what borrowers are thinking and what they're worried about. And, you know, I get this comment all the time, you know, they, they kind of understand the 75-25 the split, you know, that 75% of the proceeds, you know, need to be spent on payroll, defined payroll costs. But, but I think there's just this general kind of, well, if I spend it on payroll, it's pretty much all going to be forgiven, right? And, you know, then it gets into, well, not necessarily. Um, I'm sure some of you have, have, have gone through the act uh, at some level. Uh, but there's a number of, uh, I'll call them forgiveness offsets that are built into the bill uh, related to, the, in the two primary ones are the full-time equivalent test and a 25% excess uh, wage test. And, and really the, the goal for today was not to really talk about those in detail, but to really make sure that, you know, uh, you're talking with, you know, if you've got clients, if you've got, you know, people that have got the PPP you know, loan and, you know, so, you know, just having continuous follow-up conversation and, 
just making sure they understand the basics of, you know, it's just not that simple that if I spend it on payroll, it will be forgiven because there is that misconception out there with some folks and, and, and encourage them that, you know, that, that is a little more complicated than that, you know, get some help, you know, go to your local CPA firm and, and, and ask them, you know, if they've got calculators and tools or, or local organizations that are providing some of these things uh, to help, uh, help walk them through these calculations. Cause there are some date sensitive items in the, in these processes that it's important uh, for them to understand. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and we, we do get a lot of questions too. Well, can I do this? Can I do that? Uh, you know, can I, can I play, can I pay my 2020 bonuses early? Can I, can I add someone to the payroll that wasn't on the payroll? And, and so I, I think the overall answer is that there's really a lack of guidance. Um, yeah, I think the SBA has released uh, 47 uh, frequently asked uh, question and answers, and I believe 46 of them are related to the loan application, and only one are related to forgiveness. So we do we do anticipate you know a, a fair amount of forgiveness to come out over the next couple weeks, um, but there's just a lot of questions. You know, uh, how much rent? How many rent payments can I fit in my eight week? You know, if, if my landlord deferred January and February, can I pay those two plus two? Um, and so, you know, we're advising our clients is just, you know, you know, continue with your, you know, your current spend patterns. And then as guidance comes out, you know, let's understand what's going to be acceptable and what's not, because, you know, it'd be a shame to make up all your rent payments and then find out that, you know, guidance is that, you know, only two months of rent can be paid, period. Nothing else will be forgiven. So now you you use that cash uh, and it won't be forgiven. And so, so those are just, you know, a lot of concerns that clients are having on what to do, what not to do, what's included, what's not included. And, and so there's just, just a lot of uh, gray area that, uh, you know, we need. And the problem is that the people that got their loans very early on, you know, they're getting into week three, they're getting into week four, and they're really looking for some some answers on this. And so uh, it, it, it does change, uh, you know, fairly often. Um, so it's just a matter of keeping up on the updates and, and making sure that uh, everyone's kind of operating uh, within the guidelines that are laid out. So, um, you know, and then, you know, a couple, a couple areas that I know we are looking at, you know, for maximizing, you know, one is if, 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 if you've got a service or you manufacture items and you've got the ability to, 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 to produce a head, um, you know, that's an area that a lot of clients are looking at. You know, if, if I've already got the material in stock or if I'm heavily, you know, labor oriented, you know, if I've got people laid off, can I, can I bring them back early, you know, build some of my July and August services out or some of my pro projects and get those done during my eight week coverage period? Uh, because it really doesn't change a lot. If they were on layoff and if you bring them back early and then they go back even on layoff for a month, you know, the federal unemployment $600 payment is, is in effect through the end of July. So it could make a huge difference if they work the month, the, the month of June or, or now through the end of June uh, and, and, the, and they don't work in July, uh, they still get the unemployment benefit, but it might allow you to capture to build your forgiveness pool. Because I think the basic question we should all be asking, you know, people that have a PP loan or PPP loan is what is your projected spend on payroll? you know, over the eight week period, I think a lot of people are realizing that I'm not spending anywhere near that. And, and then, so then they question how much can be forgiven and how much will be left as a loan. And so that's, uh, those are the most critical ones that uh, really need to take a look at it. So, uh, so that, that, uh, th this was some other ideas as far as, you know, maximizing and things to consider and, and really, and that's probably the big one I run into is that I've got employees off and they don't want to come back to work and I don't really have the work and I'm just not spending anywhere near what I did, what my loan was based upon. So, you know, when you look at that full-time equivalent test, it, it really penalizes you for not getting your workforce back to its prior levels by June 30th. So I think those are just some high level conversations that you can have with people that have their PPP loan to make sure that they're, they're really 
you know, look, looking, uh, looking ahead and trying to plan because, you know, once you get into week seven and eight, you really have started to run out of runway potentially for, for, for maximizing your forgiveness. So, so it's really, you know, a planning process and, and, and clients, I know our clients are, are pretty frustrated at the minute because there's not a lot of guidance and they're trying to figure out, you know, how to maximize um, this forgiveness piece. You know, then I think it, you know, part of this is, you know, we talk a lot about forgiveness and uh, you, you really can't look at the PPP program without looking at cash management because, you know, at the end of the day, you really, you know, if you got a PPP loan and you're, you're tight on cash, you really should have a 13 week cash flow. I know, I know the banking industry is very well versed on the 13 week cash flow, but I think it's one of those things that if you're, you know, if you're, the borrowers don't have one, or if you haven't seen one, you know, it's something that, you know, we're encouraging all of our clients to make sure, you know, that they have in place because, you know, it does a couple things that really, it really kind of gets, gets the cash planning process, you know, outside of just a finance person or an accounting person, you know, when you start working in sales pipelines and plan purchases and really what does the next 13 to 20 weeks look like for our business, uh, you know, and, and what, what, what does cash really look like? How does the PPP program help us? You know, these are all things that might help in some of your forgiveness decision making. Uh, because at the end of the day, I've got some clients that are more focused about what cash will have available through the next four months is more important than how much forgiveness they maximize. So, so that is a real business consideration that, um, you know, again, when you're talking to your borrowers, uh, you know, the forgiveness is great, uh, but is, is, is it the most important thing to the business today? Um, and, and making sure there's a happy median, you know, balancing act there uh, on, on, on overall cash management versus maximizing PPP forgiveness. So, so a good 13 week cash flow, you know, will, you know, it'll be, it'll be cash based. It's not a traditional cash flow statement, just measuring balance sheet change. It's a dynamic customized tool that really looks at future sales, future plan purchases, you know, uh, payroll spending levels and, and your reoccurring bills, you know, in the weeks that they happen. So, you know, it really is a combination of taking what do we know today and what do we expect tomorrow and combining those sets of assumptions into a rolling 13 week cash projection. And, and this is where I've, I've, I've had a lot of these with my clients where we've added the third, we've added the PPP loan right into our cash projection. So now we show what's our PPP loan balance for cash and what's our, what's our remaining cash our, our what we'll call unencumbered cash because we do need to maintain that 75, 25 split on the spend of our PPP proceeds. So, so on the 13 week cash flow, we've started to split that out and track it separately to make sure we're not, you know, if the funds are in the same account that we just don't start writing checks and realize, whoa, we've, we, we actually spent that out of our PPP loan proceeds. So, so some of that, uh, some of, some of this uh, tracking is, is very important. Um, so that's that's what I had for today, just on a uh, uh, on a PPP loan perspective and cash flow. You know, some things that we're hearing, you know, from our clients, and some things we're sharing with our clients. Uh, just just to where we're at on the PPP loan forgiveness process, and then you know, really on an overarching standpoint, you know, let's let's make sure we're keeping our eye on the big picture, especially as we return to work. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, drain on cash flow as, as we get our businesses started back up and making sure that we understand uh, what the cash needs of the business are in conjunction with PPP. Uh, because, you know, some companies are looking at it, I just don't have the work and my employees are better off on unemployment. I would really need to save that cash for future periods. I'll continue to spend it on payroll, but I'll live with the fact that it might turn into a loan because I might not be able to survive with, without that cash. So those are the types of tough decisions that businesses are, are having to make. And, and I think as, you know, as lenders supporting, you know, your clients, it's also from a credit risk standpoint, it's really important to understand, you know, uh, how they're spending funds and, and how does it feed into their start back up and their cash needs and their line of credit availability. 
uh, particularly in that bottom 25% of the portfolio where, where there's some tightness in cash and line availability. So I, th I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Susan. All right. Well, uh, hello, everybody. I, um, I just want to make sure that you're seeing um, my screen here, workforce strategies during uh, COVID-19. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Tom. You know, Tom and I have been working together because our clients have a lot of, um, yes. as he mentioned, concerns back and forth about um, how do I manage the finances Other and how do I manage violate, the Violators may have action taken. So uh, one of the things that we've been really working with our uh, clients on is now what are all the things that need to be in place? So we, we look at these seven areas as indicated here, that whether you have employees already working as you have in the banking industry, um, but some places are reopening and others have returning workers. They have been on layoff since uh, mid-March. So how do we manage and have all these different things in place to make sure we're demonstrating to our employees that we have a good COVID-19 preparedness response plan? So that being number one, we have fearful employees who are concerned about coming back to work for the, their own themselves, but maybe for the people that they're living with, they don't want to bring it back into the workplace. So this is key. And I know you folks have, uh, in the banking industry have been working, but how do you remind folks uh, of what you are doing? And for those that might be working remotely, what are you doing um, on site at the, at the local um, branches? So our clients were recommending that they have a response plan, a policy, and a checklist. How are they looking at all the things that are necessary from face mask and other personal protection equipment? What are they doing about sanitizing? Uh, what are they doing around um, the different protocols? Are we doing daily screenings? Are we asking to have our thermometer or our temperature checked with a the thermometer? So it's really the Clearing what you're going to do, setting the expectations, and communicating that with the employees. I think that jumping down to the bottom one here, this is probably one of the biggest challenges is we have the federal folks, we have the um, state folks, and we have the county folks all giving us direction, right? We have CDC guidelines, we have OSHA guidelines. And so, how do we look at our industry, but then also what is our uh, particular company's policy that begins to align with these three different um, guidelines that are coming out from federal, state, and um, county orders. I, I want you to um, be aware that there's very clear safety um, issues around that, and uh, it lines up back with number one up here, the COVID-19 preparedness response plan. The other thing is that we have all these um, postings that need to go up in our sites, specifically around Families First, but please refresh your labor posters. Please refresh your um, paid medical leave act posters that uh, may have come out last year, but are now being updated by different states. And we're finding that we're having a new level of savvy employees that really do understand their legal rights as they should, but it means we have to be prepared as employers to stay up to date as well. When we're, we're dealing a lot, um, a lot of your clients as well as ours are dealing with how do we bring our employees back to work? And one of the things that I think is most critical in these times are how do you ensure that you're communicating in a, a written document? I recommend it to all my clients that they do return to work or sorry, layoff notices, temporary leave of absence notices up front. Now, if you're bringing them back, let's document that as well. Those are huge, um, uh, uh, good communication pieces, but they're also our documentation for how well we've been communicating um, with our employees and um, reiterating what we're doing around preparedness and then also um, telling them what to expect. 
Lastly, um, it's, well, not lastly, but the other area that's getting a lot, a lot of need right now is what are our policies all around Family First Leaves? So we have this COVID-19 pandemic, which we expect to continue for uh, at least through December, but who knows if it'll continue on. But these two leaves, the uh, paid sick leave and the family medical leave, both of those are um, in effect through December. And so how do we communicate what our employees' rights are under those? How are we administering those consistently to our employees who um, are continuously working, as in your case, or are now just first coming to back to work, and it may be the first time an employer has to actually apply those two leaves. So are you clear about the questions? Are you clear about the fact that you need a really good interactive dialogue for, with somebody who is saying, I'm not coming back to work. I don't wanna go out of my house. I have other people I'm responsible for and I'm very concerned about you know, getting and being exposed to COVID-19. Well, they have some rights, but it means they may be eligible for some leave, they may not, but how are you gonna handle that? And especially when you're looking at different states, for example, right now in Michigan, there's no discharge for of an employee due to a COVID-19 um, related reason. There, you can, performance issues, policy violation issues, that doesn't change the um, option for an employer to exit an employee, but right now, um, it's not the time to exit an employee, especially if it, there's a COVID-19 related issue. We also know that there's remote work policies, there's um, uh, flexible arrangement policies, there's business travel policies. All, uh, there could be policies around how um, paid time off or vacations being handled. So all of these are new areas that we have to educate our employees around. We have to be able to administer them consistently so we don't end up with a, an EEOC or discrimination or some sort of bias that could trigger a complaint later. Lastly, I, we are seeing a lot of companies who are trying to manage cash flow, as, as Tom indicated, and so therefore are implementing reductions in wages. Um, and vice versa, there might be others who are offering a hazard pay or a hero pay. Um, they might be offering sort of a thank you for sticking with me bonus. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that are happening in the compensation arena. Some of them are all around benefits as well. What benefits um, is the company uh, still paying for if somebody's out on leave, a, a temporary leave of absence? When does it become a qual COBRA qualifying event? Um, how are you coordinating all of those communications with your benefit brokers? So huge area, oh, 401k, um, lots of direction and guidance under um, the CARES Act around retirement plans. So this area deserves its own level of attention. Um, it's really, as Tom's mentioned, how are you looking forward? How are we looking at business survivability and our business thriving, right? We want our businesses to continue to thrive. So what are some of the short-term actions we might need to take there? And lastly, you know, we're, I, I am communicating from my office, which is now my dining room table, as many of you may be. So how do we um, recognize that people might be moving towards um, stress under this new work environment, maybe transitioning back from working at home back into offices, or even in, um, as you may have find, you have, um, your employees have been working right along, um, but have family members have been off, and so there's this uh, new level of either stress or burnout um, that could be happening, and so how do we keep a pulse on what's top of mind with our employees and so things like pulse surveys and getting some feedback from employees seeking out their opinions can certainly be valuable at this time so we're communicating and addressing um, some of the concerns they have so these seven areas are the areas that i believe employers uh, need to be focused on right now um, having thought these things through in advance and reevaluate them, reevaluating them um, often is uh, 
probably the best workforce strategies you can have right now. We're, um, we're on calls with clients daily dealing with whatever the hot topic might be um, or what employee concern they're dealing with at the moment. And um, certainly as we open this to q and I'm happy to talk into more detail where you folks might have an interest. So Stephanie, that's sort of my uh, brief but broad overview and I turn it back to you. Your ADA master document. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Susan. I'll go ahead and um, check out the chat bar. Someone just mentioned um, if a copy of the presentation will be provided, we are recording it. Um, Susan and Tom, if you can send me your slide deck as well, that would be great. Um, and then a couple of questions came in to Tom that I forwarded to your email. And I would be happy to unmute all the lines if someone would like to ask a verbal question. Or you can certainly chat, put it in the chat box anytime as well. Uh, Stephanie, I guess I can start with asking or yeah. replying to a couple of the questions that came in email. So uh, the first question was, do I need to meet the entire 75% requirement to get any loan forgiveness? And yeah, I, I, I think I'll, I'll give you, there, there's two answers to that. One is, uh, there's a requirement to spend 75% on, on payroll um, related defined expenses. So that, that, that's really an operating standard that's been laid out that when you sign up, you said from day one, I'm going to be spending 75% of these proceeds. So the, the, the straightforward answer there is that if you, know, if you don't have any payroll, you shouldn't be writing a check for rent because you, you, know, you have no payroll expenses. So, so I think that's a upfront uh, control standpoint that you, know, you just have to be uh, managing that that's how you're spending it. On the forgiveness side, there is a cap uh, on non-payroll uh, expenditures that is 25% of total forgiveness. Uh, we're, our, our interpretation is that'll be after all the other tests. So if there are offsets, related to FTE or 25% excess wage reduction, you know, those would be applied and then there will be a test that that, that forgiveness component is not more than 25% um, of, of non-payroll expenses. So, so, so we don't, we don't see that there's any, any, any kind of cliff on, on a way that you don't get anything forgiven. I think what's been laid out is how you're supposed to spend the money and then when you spend it in the, in, in, in the appropriate split, then there's a, uh, a calculation to get to your final forgiveness number. Uh, a second question I have is, uh, it, I've got uh, a dentist and employees, they've been furloughed since March 15th. They don't anticipate opening until the, the stay at home order uh, lifts. Uh, funds were received on on May 7th. You know, I don't know how it's possible to meet 75% uh, requirements. Um, is there any indication the SBA will change the eight-week requirement in the June 30th date? First, I want to talk a little bit about the eight weeks in relationship to the June 30th date. Uh, in, in, in the CARES Act, it, it defines the eight weeks within the forgiveness section. Um, the, the June 30th is not referenced in that same section of code. So there, there is a feeling that the eight weeks is the eight weeks regardless of when you get your loan, uh, but it is inconsistent because if the tests are based on June 30th, the way the code's written now, you could potentially have to measure those two tests uh, in the middle of your eight week period if it runs beyond June 30th. Uh, so, so there is some, some, some uh, Clarification: I expect that we'll get when guidance comes out, um, but 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 uh, but where where it defines the eight week period after you get your loan, uh, the reference to June 30th isn't in that section. The reference to June 30th is is in the rehire and is in some of these measurement periods. So so it's a bit inconsistent in how it's written, um, but I do think we'll get some clarification on whether a you know they're going to extend that June 30th date to align with loans that are, are 
because technically you can get a loan up till June 30th. So you could get a loan on June 29th and that, so I think there'll be some clear, some, some guidance uh, on there that, to kind of clear that up. But, uh, um, but again, you're just spending at that 75% minimum number for payroll. So, um, so theoretically, if, if you got to where you couldn't spend it, you, it should just be cash in your account. Uh, you could spend it beyond your eight weeks. It's just, it wouldn't be forgiven. It would convert to a loan at that point. And then one other one was I have a, a PPP loan and an and a, and a EDL disaster loan. Does the EDL re reduce the amount of the PPP loan that I can use? So it, it doesn't impact from a cash basis. Let's say you got the $10,000 EDL grant uh, and you got a $100,000 a PPP loan, uh, there, there is no impact on your PPP loan, uh, but the EDL grant is deducted from your forgiveness. Uh, so that 10,000 uh, would be deducted from your forgiveness calculation because it is a grant. And so they don't want a lot, they're, they're not allowing those to work in, in, in conjunction. Thanks, Tom. A couple other questions. Can employers pay extra to employees on payroll for like hazard pay and have it count as regular payroll for the forgiveness? Yes, I think, you know, we, uh, as long as it's reasonable, as long as it's under, uh, you know, there, there is a $100,000 uh, cap uh, on the forgiveness calculation. So uh, if you've got someone making more than $100,000, uh, I mean, you can do hazard pay, uh, but it won't be forgiven. Um, so, so there's no restriction on, you know, as long as it's flowing into that gross payroll line, um, it, 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 it's a, uh, it's, it's going to be an allowable um, payroll expenditure. It's just on the forgiveness. If it's over the 100,000 pro rate of level, uh, you're not going to get forgiveness for it. Um, so you got to be careful a little bit with bonuses and commissions and, and how much, because it could, it could push you over that pro rate of calculation. And, and essentially make it ineligible for forgiveness. So, um, and, and there, there is no guidance uh, either on, on any bonus, larger type bonuses, or anything that's outside of your past practices. So I do expect there will be some guidance in that area. Uh, so, so we are, again, just, just like with the non-payroll expenses, we're just encouraging, you know, do what you're doing, some of these larger type things to try to maximize Let's get some additional guidance because you know, we'd hate for you to, you know, put a, put, a, put a new bonus program in place that wasn't in place prior and then the SBA put out some guidance that, that is going to put restrictions on certain, certain things like that. So, um, so, so but, but I think those basic things. Go ahead, Susan, I think you want to comment on that. Yeah, well. um, so absolutely we need to keep the whole PPP in line and all of its rules and guidelines. But if really we're looking at the option to provide a bonus or some sort of additional pay as a way that's gonna provide productiveness or engage employees, as we would make those kinds of decisions beyond just there's an opportunity to have some forgiveness. So it's a balance, isn't it, of what's available um, under this PPP plan, but also what's the right thing to do in terms of um, maximizing our employee uh, loyalty, productiveness, reward for, you know, work done. Um, so I think I wouldn't ever say just put it in place because we have an opportunity for forgiveness. I would say what, it, what is the reason we're putting it in place and, you know, how do we look at this? Is this a one-time scenario or is there something we're really looking at doing um, over a longer period of time? So just putting that sort of another perspective on it for sure. Okay, there's another question. Um, we are fielding several questions on hazard pay and bonus pay. While I understand there's no clarity is available as to this, um, are you suggesting clients hold cash back to retain as much as possible in the event it isn't forgiven so they can return it? Well, you know, that, that, that's a case by case, you know, analysis. Um, but I think, um, you know, most, most employers are looking at what's best for my employees, what's best for my business. You know, and when, when, when I look at what's best for my business, a lot of times it's cash 
what what do I really need for cash? Is it better for me to get more money in my employees' pockets because I'm worried about retaining them? Or are my employees fine and I'm better holding the cash and realizing that it may affect my forgiveness, but that cash will still be there. Now, if you don't want a loan, if you're very debt averse and you're just gonna run your business the way you're gonna run it, yeah, I mean, there's no prepayment penalties on, on, on this program. You do pay the 1% interest, but that's gonna be pretty nominal. So uh, any amount that's converted to loan, there's six months of deferral. And so, you know, they've got some time, even if they just wanna take a wait and see approach, which we're advising with a lot of our clients, segregate the cash and, and you know, you can always just pay it back within that six month uh, deferral period uh, at the cost of 1% per month, which uh, is pretty reasonable. So. Uh, so that's really a personal preference on the ownership of the business and, and really what, what, what is their debt, debt comfort level and how they want to handle it. So, um, Stephanie, there were a few questions that came in regarding um, wearing face masks, um, whether it's optional or required, and, you know, how does that uh, handle you know, it's interesting because I think that's definitely back to the guidelines that are um, defined by um, most most recently state and local guidelines. And then it's what is what in addition, what are you going to do as a company policy? Definitely, there's um, reasons for which an employee uh, medical reasons, religion, religious accommodations for which an employee may not have to wear a mask. Um, so if somebody on your team is saying they don't want to, now uh, what's that conversation you're going to have with them? There is guidance out there that says, um, you know, if you, an employee declines to wear a face mask for non-medical reasons, then you need to be evaluating those reasons and then um, as long as you're engaging in the interactive process and understanding it, um, you, you may be permitted to have them not return to work and uh, may be disciplined. So it's a very fine balance, but it's definitely a conversation to have. And I think it's what is our company policy going to be in line with um, what is the state and county orders right now. So interesting conversations we never thought we'd have before. <clears throat> So um, I've got one other question here that popped up. It says, uh, is the employee count on June 30th based upon FTE or is it simply a payroll roster count where part-time employees count? Um, you know, this, this is a big, one of the big guidance questions out because they, they did release some guidance saying the application is going to be based on pure headcount, whether part-time or full-time. But in that same sentence, clarifying the, the loan application uh, count methodology, they just referenced that the forgiveness will be different. So we do expect some type of hours-based calculation. Uh, we're just not sure whether it's going to be uh, like a 30-hour minimum to qualify as a full-time equivalent, or if it's going to be an aggregation of hours divided by a weekly number to get a full-time equivalent. So, so we, we, we just don't have clear guidance on on exactly what that FTE definition is going to be uh, for the for, for the for the test at this point. So, um, and so I think you know too. This is you know one of the things I wanted to throw a question out to the group is, you know, obviously there's there's a lot of banks kind of represented here, but you know what what what, what, what what's everyone thinking as far as collecting information for the loan forgiveness? Uh, I mean, is, is, does anyone have anything to share on what their process? might look like or, you know, the approach, uh, is everyone going to have their own design portal or template that uh, they're gonna collect information and, and how, how, how are you staffed to, I guess, process all that information, uh, you know, to, to meet, meet the, the timing, you know, deadlines within the bill? Has um, is, is, is there been, you know, much planning or discussion around that point, you know, so far?
is unbelievable to us. This is Matthew Keene from Citizens National Bank. No, we, we are preparing for it, but we're, we're only theorizing right now because we don't know what the guidance is going to be and what's going to require. So we've got third party vendors calling us and saying they can lend a hand, but I'm not sure how they're going to do that because they don't even have the guidance. So it's kind of odd that they have planned in place to forgive something that they don't know how to forgive yet, just like us. So um, we're, yeah. we're reviewing what we think it might look like, but again, we should know in theory by next what, Monday because uh, before the Congress, um, before their meeting. So um, no, we have not finalized that yet. Sure. Any yeah, other I questions? I think that's one of the big, you know, that, that's one of the big questions, you know, how, how is this all going to get processed in a timely fashion when you consider the amount of loans that are out there? And, uh, you know, so this whole forgiveness processing and approval process seems like it's going to be a pretty challenging, you know, thing for everyone to, not only from a, from a borrower perspective, to get their information all gathered and into some kind of reasonable format template and an and adequate amount of support documentation. And then, then the entire review interpretation and approval, you know, kind of, of, of that, because, you know, it's one thing on the loan side, it, it's an amount that it's kind of like, well, it's gotta be paid back unless proven otherwise. Right. So, so it is a loan document, uh, but the forgiveness, I mean, that's where rubber is going to hit the road. You know, that's real dollars being expensed through the federal budget. And so, you know, that's, that's the piece where it seems like, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have this uh, potential for things to get bogged down, I think. I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, the, the Steve Saltz from Chelsea State Bank. Chat, question for Tom. And the, the FTE test, you know, assuming uh, borrowers spend it exactly how it's supposed to be spent. I've seen in all the interim rules referencing this FTE test, but I haven't seen how it's going to be calculated. No, I, I think we're pretty good, you know, I, I think from our perspective, we just don't know the hours or the, you know, the, the pure definition, but I think once we know the definition, then I think we understand the calculation because it's, it's simply comparing your coverage period against the prior period. And those two prior periods are either February 15th through June 30th of 19 or uh, January 1st, 2020 through February 29th, 2020, you know, that is a per payroll monthly average, you know, for either of those two, the better of the two will be compared against your coverage period uh, with the caveat being that you've got the ability to cure that if you rehire by June 30th. So once we kind of know the definition of, hey, a full-time equivalent is if it's 32 hours, or if it's 32 hours per person and then that person ahead, you know, I think once we know those numbers, then we can run through the, you know, the calculation. But, you know, this is the one that's got the greatest impact because the folks that are struggling to spend their money, uh, if they, if they fail the, the, the full-time equivalent test, it's a straight reduction. So, you know, in the example that I had a hundred employees in my prior period, and I started my, my uh, loan forgiveness period with 50, and I never was in a position to bring back any, and I ended up at 50, that's a straight 50% reduction. And so not only did you not spend as much as you thought you were going to spend, but the amount that you spend uh, got reduced by 50%. So, so that's, that's the, probably the biggest example. I mean, that's the biggest concern with a, with our, a lot of our clients is, is understanding how to cure that by June 30th, what it means, and and making sure they minimize that impact because that that's where you know it's a double whammy. You spend less, and you get less of a credit towards forgiveness, and that's that's um, 
that's going to be a problem for, for a lot of, so, of yes yeah, so Tom a lot of our clients were worried about bringing back people that they couldn't make productive but they started mm -hmm. bringing them back anyways because they thought that was the spirit of the program to keep their all their employees so they are bringing back employees right. and paying them for basically doing very little bit you know and then but they're right. slowly increasing their their headcount and there's mm -hmm. always been this gray area as to whether they're going to get penalized for it or not getting up to the right. full headcount. Yeah. So in your example, well, that, in that, yeah. with that 50 people versus 100, so they're really only going to get forgiven for paying half of their people, half of those 50 people. Right, right. And then they could have been so, keeping them employed because they thought that's what they're supposed to do, is keep as many people employed as possible, whether they're productive or not creating revenue or not yeah and and this is where it flies in the face of the intent because you know if if, if they're going to be very mechanical with this the way they've written this and how it's going to be interpreted you know that's how we interpret it but you know that's where i think we're looking for guidance to, to, to just make sure everyone's clear on this calculation because as it's written you know you could bring back a bunch of people your last payroll in that june period and and you could pass the uh, the full-time equivalent test. Now it may still hurt you on the 25% wage reduction test, but again, that's, uh, you know, so these are the things that we're trying to get clear, uh, guidance on so we can help our clients really navigate this because uh, this is, this is that was one of the first slides where we get this misconception that, well, if I spend it on payroll, it's all 100% forgiven, right? And it's like, well, not necessarily because of some of these other tests and so, yeah, you know, that's that's where uh, um, you know we're, we're you know could you bring everyone back you know but a lot of business owners are like well why would I do that you know now I'm just a conduit I'm just I'm just transferring this money from one to the other and 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 I don't know that that makes you know any sense and then you you conflict that with anyone making less than twenty three dollars an hour that can do better on unemployment. So if you've got a $15 an hour employee that you're like, hey, you know, uh, you know, John, I'm going to do, I'm going to do you really well here. I'm going to keep you paid and you don't have to work and you're going to get your wage. And they're going to say, well, why would you do that? I can make $24 an hour in unemployment and you're going to pay me, you know, 15, you know, all my other peers are making 23 in unemployment and you're, you're really doing me wrong here. Why would you do that to me? And so, you know, this, this is where, you know, some of the programs obviously weren't aligned as, as well as they could have been. Right. The spirit of the program um, because, was to keep people employed. So obviously if they're yeah. giving away money, then there's a reason that the, those people they're keeping employed cannot produce enough revenue to justify it. So that's right. why a lot of right. my customers were keep, are keeping people on board that are not producing revenue. Right. I mean, why else would they that, come up and, with this program if you're not supposed to be incented to keep people on your payroll, whether or not you're making money? Right. No, I, I understand. And that's, you know, the, there are a lot of people in, in that category practicing that way. And, but there's, there's, you know, the other pro problem is that when this program went into effect, a lot of people already had their operations shut down. So again, trying to get people to come, you know, Re get them back on payroll and, and restart things. Uh, uh, you know the timing of it was less than ideal. So, um, so you know that's that's why you know we're, we're hoping for some additional guidance on how these all these tests work together and really what's what's the true intent um, so that we can give give better guidance to our clients and borrowers. But uh, but but it is it is uh, there there is some. Uh, a wide, there's a wide range of how people are, are spending the money, using the money uh, in relationship to employees, whether they keep them on layoff or they bring them back. So. Or okay. do a mix. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for Susan or Tom? Nope. Well, 
Um, thanks everyone for joining us. I will send out a recording of this um, along with their slide decks and their contact information so you can reach out if you have any questions. But appreciate your time, both Susan and Tom and Raymond, for sponsoring this webinar today and look forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a great weekend. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.